Uh, and with that, it is my absolute pleasure to introduce our speaker today. Uh, so Dr. David uh, Smolovich is a neurologist, a neuroontologist, and a medical researcher. He holds a PhD from the University of Melbourne, and his clinical and research interests include diseases of the cerebellum, uh, vestibular systems, and the combination of the two. Uh, David is the founding head of the Balance Disorders and Ataxia Service at the Royal Victorian Eye and Ear Hospital, uh, which is awarded uh, the National Ataxia Foundation's Ataxia Center of Excellence status. Uh, his awards include the ANZAN, uh, uh, Jim Lance uh, Young Investigators Award, uh, the Alfred Calbini Hospital for uh, Melbourne GlaxoSmithKind Physician Advanced Training Prize for Research, a Vic Health Award for Outstanding uh, Achievement in the Field of Health Promotion. So thank you everyone for joining and thank you to NAF for the invitation to speak about Canvas. Um, I uh, hopefully will have some time at the end for questions. So I'm a neurologist who specializes in um, ataxias um, and we, uh, we have a large um, clinic here in Melbourne, Australia uh, and uh, the rest of my time is largely dedicated to um, ataxia research. All right, next slide, please. So just a summary of what Canvas is. So Canvas has three cardinal features as we described it. The first involves an underactivity of the inner ear balance mechanism. So this is the vestibular areflexia vestibular meaning inner ear balance mechanism. Um, the second part is cerebellar ataxia, which I imagine that most of you are familiar with, but the cerebellum um, sits at the um, back and base of the brain uh, and is involved in a lot of important brain functions, uh, many of which are around uh, coordination and balance. And then the third, um, cardinal feature of canvas is reduced sensation, for example, in the arms and legs. Uh, a fourth feature, which generally uh, comes on years to decades prior to the ataxia is a chronic cough. Next slide. All right, so first up, um, I'm going to talk a bit about the inner ear balance mechanism. Um, and what we're seeing here are um, slides with a view of the inner ear under the microscope. So in the top left, you're seeing a person who um, does not have canvas and what I want to show you is that you can see labelled there the hearing nerve, which stains um, purple and is normal. And then you also see the balance or vestibular nerve, um, which is also staining purple. And if we go across to the slide on the right, um, you'll see that the, the hearing nerve, again, is staining normal. But if you look at the balance nerve, you'll see it's very faint, which means that essentially it's um, lost a lot of um, the fibres that make up the nerve. Uh, but that's not the whole story. So if we go to the bottom left panel, um, and this is what we call high magnification, so it's magnified more, uh, we see a lot of these sort of fluffy purple cells with dots in the middle. Um, but if we look to the right in the person with canvas, we see that there's only a very few of these cells. Um, and these are actually in a structure called the vestibular ganglion. And the ganglia are like little relay stations. And so what we were able to discover with this work was that the problem wasn't actually the vestibular or inner ear balance um, organ, it was the little relay stations or ganglia, what we call the ganglionopathy. So next slide, please. All right, so now the second component, and this is the cerebellar atrophy or shrinkage. And if we look at the 
top left, we see an MRI of a person's cerebellum with canvas. And the arrows are showing areas where there's been shrinkage of the cerebellum. And this is out on the sides of the cerebellum, if you like. And if we look to the right, um, we see the middle or the midline of the cerebellum and you can see significant shrinkage and that's all the black parts between the white. The white is the remaining cerebellar tissue. And then if we look at panel C, what we see is an actual cerebellum from a person um, with canvas who's passed away and donated their brain to research. And we see that um, the MRI was very accurate. And in fact, it's exactly the same pattern of shrinkage. And similar, similarly, I'm sorry, in panel D, we see that in the midline, you're getting the same pattern of shrinkage. Patterns, e, so panels E and F are really showing, again, microscope view of the cerebellar shrinkage. And in F, we're able to drill right down and see which layer of cells causes this shrinkage. And it's called the Purkinje cell layer, which is a very important component um, of the cerebellum. Next, please. Okay, so then the third component is the reduction in sensation. And just a little bit of background. So the, the top yellow panel shows the um, spine and what you can see are the nerves exiting the spine and then the red arrow points to what's called the dorsal root ganglia. So this is the ganglia again, but this time these are little relay stations just outside of the spine. And so what happens is sensation comes in from the periphery, for example, the feet and the hands, and travels in nerves to the dorsal root ganglia. And what we were able to find with this work is that those ganglia are also affected. So if we're having a look um, at that microscope picture on the right, you see that there's one or two large round um, cells, which are the sort of pinky color. And really that's all where that should be full of those cells. And if we look at the photos, what you're seeing in the person without canvas, um, where the red arrow is pointing, is the nerves traveling out of the spine and towards the ganglia. And on the right bottom photo, what you're seeing is a person with canvas and you can see that those little nerves are very skinny. And again, they've shrunk because of the um, loss of cells in the ganglia. Um, and this in fact is why people with canvas lose sensation in the peripheries and can sometimes have unpleasant sensations. But we'll talk more about that. Next please, Celeste. Okay, so how do we diagnose canvas? Let's go through that. So next slide. So again, going through the components one at a time, the inner ear balance function is tested using what we call formal vestibular function tests. And there are a range of different ways of testing this, but I'm gonna talk about one which is called the video head impulse test. Um, and this is where a set of goggles are used to track the eye movements while the head is turned quickly. Um, and if you go to the top trace, you see the person without canvas, the red line is the head movement and the black line is the eye movement. And you can see that they overlap. So they're essentially the same. So the vestibular system is doing its job. If we go down to the bottom two graphs, which are a person with canvas, you see again, the red lines show the head movements, but this time the eyes, the black lines um, are flat. And this is the vestibular areflexia or the vestibular 
hypo function where it's not working adequately. And what you see is you see that it's quite flat and then you see a lot of tall vertical lines. And these are the corrective movements that the eyes make to get back on target. Next, please, Celeste. All right, so then how do we diagnose the cerebellar component? Look, the main reason, the main way we do this is at the bedside with our examination, but we also look at the structure of the cerebellum um, using an MRI. And um, as I showed you a few slides back, there's a pattern of shrinkage that we see. Next, please. And then the third component, which is the dorsal root ganglionopathy or dorsal root neuronopathy. And we can test this at, on, during the bedside examination by seeing whether people are able to feel, for example, um, a sharp stimulus such as a pin um, or vibration. But the most robust way of doing this is using what we call nerve conduction studies. And there's a photo here of someone having nerve conduction studies. And essentially what we do is measure the nerve's ability um, to conduct a small impulse that's introduced um, using that white um, bit of equipment on the right, on the underneath of the foot. Um, and what we went on to do with Canvas was um, to construct a protocol that let us um, differentiate a ganglionopathy, which we see in canvas from the more common neuropathy, um, which for example, one might see with diabetes. Next, please. The other thing that's important um, in the diagnosis of canvas um, is that is this eye test um, called the visually enhanced VOR or VVOR to its friends. Um, and part of our work in Canvas was to set up an objective version of this using special goggles. Um, unfortunately, the video won't show, but essentially what happens is that the person's head is moved slowly side to side while they look at a dot on the wall um, and we look to see where the eye, whether the eye movements are smooth. So on the left, um, the traces, you'll see the red and the black overlie each other. And there are very few of those vertical lines, which are corrective movements to make sure that the person stays on the target, which is the dot on the wall, versus the trace on the right, which is the person with canvas, where you see the black and red don't overlay and you get a lot of these tall, what we call high amplitude, corrective eye movements to try and keep the eyes on the target. Um, and that is what we call a broken up or saccadic VVOR. Next, please. All right, so having diagnosed Canvas, and I won't go into it in detail because you have a talk coming up, but now that we have um, the gene, um, we're able to test for that gene, RFC1, um, which is not necessarily a test of canvas because we now know, having discovered the gene, that the gene can um, cause other conditions, um, not necessarily the full triad of canvas. All right, so next, please. So, there are two things that I tell my patients that I'll always worry about when I see them for their um, regular reviews. And one is their swallow function and two is falls. So ataxia is summarized as meaning poor coordination. And we tend to think of coordination as affecting the arms and legs, for example, but it doesn't. It affects a lot of other muscle functions and swallow is actually a complicated process where you need to get the food from the front of your mouth to the food tube 
avoiding the breathing tube because what we don't want um, is food, drink, or our own saliva to go down the breathing tube into the lungs because that can cause a very serious pneumonia that we call aspiration pneumonia. Um, and given all the muscles involved in the process of swallow, it's um, not uncommon for people to have difficulties. And the difficulties might be that they may cough and splutter with certain foods or drink. Um, food might get stuck. Some people need to double swallow in order to get food down. And we're always keen to know if this happens. Um, next slide, please. Because what we do is arrange for people to have a swallow assessment um, with uh, a speech therapist. Um, and this is, this is not an invasive process. Um, if the person is having difficulties with swallowing, then it's generally very easy to mitigate or reduce the chance um, of um, aspiration. But the important thing is that um, the person put their hand up um, to make sure that they do get an assessment from a speech therapist who's experienced with swallow assessment. Okie doke, next please. All right, so the second thing is imbalance and falls. And there's an increasing um, body of research evidence to show that specialised neurological physical therapy or neurological physiotherapy um, is effective in reducing serious falls and maintaining a person's um, independent function, so their ability to continue to get around on their own. And it's important that this is specialised um, physical therapy and not just general or what's called musculoskeletal physical therapy. The other thing um, that's very important is having an occupational therapy assessment of the home to identify um, and reduce falls risks. And um, as you'll see in the bottom left, often this involves um, guidance on placement of grab rails. The bathroom is generally the most diabolical room, so there are often um, modifications that need to be made. Uh, next, please. So the concern with falls um, is the risk of um, breaking bones. And whilst, of course, we don't want anyone to fall, if they do fall, we'd rather they fall on a strong bone um, than one that's thinned. So what we um, recommend here is that people have what's called a DEXA bone densitometry scan that looks at the bone density. Um, and if in fact there is bone thinning or what's called osteoporosis, uh, there are drugs which can return bone density. Uh, so this is very important. Um, for some people, calcium and vitamin D may be important um, in maintaining bone strength. But the other thing is exercise because bones require movement and weight put on them in order to maintain their strength or density. Okay, next please. All right, so now canvas can affect the automatic or autonomic nervous system. And this is part of the nervous system that carries out functions um, that are required even when we're not thinking about them. So um, this includes sweating. It includes keeping enough blood pressure that there's blood traveling through your brain all the time. Um, even when, for example, you stand up and gravity wants to force the blood down into the legs. So when this mechanism isn't working optimally, what happens is that someone can stand up, um, the blood pressure um, is forced down, um, 
and they can faint, for want of a better word, um, and the risk is what we call an unprotected fall. So because um, you lose consciousness briefly, you don't put your arms out to protect yourself. And I've had patients um, have these type of falls and fall straight onto their face um, and cause some nasty injuries. So the important thing is that if this is a feature of someone's canvas, then it's eminently treatable. And there are multiple ways of treating it, um, making sure that you have plenty of fluids, um, thick type compression stockings, which force the fluid, the blood, I should say, um, to stay higher up in the body, in the head, rather than pull in the legs. There's specialised physical therapy for this, as well as medications if necessary, which are generally very good at increasing the blood pressure. Next, please. All right. So earlier on, we talked about um, issues the third sort of cardinal feature of canvas issues with sensation coming back from the periphery to the spine and then up into the brain. And one of these is what's called neuropathic pain, which is nerve pain. Um, and this pain tends to be sharp, shooting, searing, burning. It tends to be a particular type of pain, not just a dull ache. Um, the other thing that um, can happen if sensations not being adequately conveyed um, from the peripheries is that you can lose sensation. So people will describe that when they put their feet on the ground, it feels like um, it's dull or there's cotton wool under their feet. Um, and the other thing that can happen is that a normal stimulus can elicit an uncomfortable or painful response. So for example, um, someone might be lying in bed and the movement of the blanket over their feet can be painful or uncomfortable. This is called dysesthesia. So there are a range of medications and what's important to know is that they're not the usual pain medications. They're specific um, neuropathic or nerve pain um, medications and these are generally effective and I've listed some of them here. Um, usually um, in my practice I use um, the first one pregabalin or Lyrica um, as first line treatment. Next please. All right so then um, not infrequently people will ask me about whether or not it's safe to drive and that, that will depend on how severe their canvas is but um, often people are safe to drive. Now it differs in different countries but um, occupational therapists um, can conduct driving assessments um, to check for the safety um, but also to advise on car modifications. So some people will have hand controls because the coordination in their legs is um, inadequate to be able to manage the pedals, but they're able to use hand controls instead. Um, there are specialised, for example, roof rack systems um, whereby a wheelchair can be mounted on the roof of the car and lowered down safely. Um, public transport, um, again, this depends on the individual's um, level of balance as to whether or not it's safe. Um, again, depending on where you are, you may be eligible for um, discounted taxi fares. Uh, and um, some hospitals and other organisations have volunteer drivers who help people get to appointments um, and um, other important tasks such as shopping. Next, please. All right. So 
I think that um, just about everyone with Canvas experiences a range of feelings which are very understandable. Um, and I think that part of the difficulty is not only that there's a loss of function um, that people have to adjust to, but that because the condition progresses or gets worse over time, um, there's an ongoing process of having to adjust um, to losses over time. So this um, can be helped in a number of ways. Um, some people find it very helpful um, to have contact with people who have a similar condition. Um, and I'm perhaps uh, preaching to the converted here because um, that may be how you got onto NAF in this talk, but support groups are very helpful. Um, and there are large support groups like NAF, and depending on where you are, there are sometimes smaller community um, as well as online groups. There are, of course, health professionals, um, such as psychologists or counsellors, some of whom um, specialise in um, the adjustment to an ongoing condition, um, such as Canvas. Um, some people find it very helpful to be informed. Um, and um, the caution here that I always offer people is that like much on the internet, most of what you read is unreliable. And so reliable sources such as the NAF and Ataxia UK um, are safe and I highly recommend them, but just be very careful with what Dr. Google spits out because I don't think Dr. Google's a particularly good doctor. Next, please. So where to next with Canvas? Um, so we continue to work on what's called phenotyping, which is the details of the condition as it manifests in different people. Um, and we continue to do that in what with what we call objective metrics, so devices to measure this rather than the traditional way of having, for example, the neurologist look and give um, an opinion. Um, there's also active research looking at how the gene, so the RFC1, leads to Canvas, so we don't yet understand how that happens. Um, trial readiness data. So gene therapies are on the way um, and there's a global movement um, to try and make sure that um, neurologists uh, and other doctors involving in seeing people with ataxias, um, as well as researchers, have a central repository of um, patients and their details such that when the drug companies are ready to run trials, they can come to us and say, we want X amount of people um, with this condition at this level of severity and we'll be able to contact our patients and say, there's a trial if you're interested. Um, and of course, that's to develop disease modifying treatments. Um, and if anyone's interested, we have an ongoing research project um, which tests for RFC1. Unfortunately, it's still hard to get a commercially available test for RFC1. Um, so I can be contacted. Um, my email address uh, was on the first slide. Um, I'm happy for NAF to give that out if um, people are interested in being tested. Next. Um, and that's just a um, reminder for me um, to mention that we were one of two groups who discovered the RFC1 gene and you've got a, um, a talk coming up from Andrea soon on the details of that. And next, please. And that's just an acknowledgement that this type of research involves lots of people over a long time. And in fact, the discovery of um, 
Canvas as a clinical syndrome was the topic of my PhD, which seems like a lot of years ago now. All right. Thank you. Well, thank you uh, so much, Dr. Smilovich. Uh, we're going to be having our Q&A period now. We've already have some questions in the Q&A window, but just a reminder for attendees, if you do have any questions for our speaker, to be please write them in the Q&A window. Unfortunately, we can't unmute uh, participants. And for folks who are interested, uh, a recording of this session is going to be made available through the National Taxi Foundation in just a couple weeks. So give me one second so I can pull up the Q&A window to see what people are asking, and then we're gonna get started. Uh, so first question, uh, how common is it for Canvas patients to experience sleep disturbances? What's known about that? Yeah, um, look, it's a great question because um, we know that one, certain sleep um, disorders such as um, obstructive sleep apnea are very common in the general population. Two, we know that in a range of um, ataxias, sleep dis um, disorders are more common um, than in the general population. We don't yet have good data on sleep in canvas. Um, and I think this is, you know, one of the gazillion areas of canvas that needs more research. Um, but I think the bottom line is that if someone has concerns around their sleep, um, then I think it's prudent to um, get a referral to a sleep specialist um, who can then, if necessary, arrange um, a sleep study. And so irrespective of whether it is canvas related or not, um, the treatments tend to be relatively universal. Um, and so I would suggest that anyone with sleep concerns um, tries to get uh, a referral to a sleep specialist doctor. That's good to know that there's support available. Our next question, uh, are there different tremors associated with RFC1 Canvas? If yes, could you please describe them? Yeah, so um, the, the most common tremor, um, which in fact, it's called a tremor, but technically it's not, um, is what we call an intention tremor. Um, and so this is a tremor whereby the amplitude or the size of the movement increases as the person um, gets closer to the target. So I'll try and show you what it looks like. So the target's my finger here. And when we ask people to do this test, Around the middle, their finger is relatively still. And then as it approaches the target, it becomes larger in amplitude. So while it looks silly to see me do it between my finger and my nose, if you imagine eating, then as your hand with the cutlery approaches the food, your movements become more inaccurate. So it's very difficult. Um, and that's by far the most common tremor that we see in canvas. Um, there are other tremors um, that are seen um, and um, other manifestations of the incoordination whereby people's movement will be inaccurate. So they may miss the target um, and that's called dysmetria. But the intention tremor is by far the most common that we see. Well, thank you for clarifying that. We have a number of people who are asking questions about exercise. So the two questions that are coming up are, mm -hmm. is exercise helpful for people with Canvas? And is it possible to exercise too much? Could it do harm if you overexert yourself? Yeah. So look, I think the exercise question gets back to what I was saying about neurological physical therapy. Um, and I think that this is by far one of the most important things that people should aim to do because we have this growing evidence base that it helps people maintain their functional status. Um, and so ideally you see a neurological physical, physical therapist. Um, some people also see an exercise physiologist who works under the guidance of the physical therapist um, in terms of helping people exercise optimally and safely. Um, 
And in terms of um, overdoing it, I mean, overdoing it can affect people's energy levels and often fatigue is an issue, but you won't damage yourself or make the canvas worse. And so, um, you know, some people, while they're settling into an exercise regime, may find that they overdo it. Um, and it's a matter of pulling back a bit and then extending themselves to find the optimal level, um, which, of course, if you're doing it under the guidance of a professional, you'll have their input to aid with that. Oh, that's very good to know. Uh, so our next question, uh, are you familiar with portable neuromodulation simulator, uh, or my apologies, stimulator devices, and can they be used to treat canvas? Yeah, so look, there are a couple of devices. One of them is, uh, for example, a PONS device that uses tongue stimulation. Um, and um, look, the devices have a very, very small evidence base. To my mind, it's not anything near conclusive in terms of helping. And as far as I know, there's not been any specific trial um, in Canvas. Um, so again, um, I would um, advise people that neurological physio physical therapy has a much stronger evidence base um, and to pursue that. Fantastic. And then we have a few people asking questions about access to genetic testing, which you touched on a little bit before. Mm. Right now in the US, there's uh, two uh, organizations you can go to for genetic testing. Can you speak to uh, what you know uh, that is being done to make testing more widely available? Yeah. So look, I mean, the issue seems to be that it's not a particularly easy test to perform. And so the commercial laboratories um, are taking quite a while um, to get their testing up and running, um, or some have abandoned it. The other issue is, and that, um, and Andrea will go into this in more detail, but the RFC1, um, the change in the RFC1 gene um, is not unitary. So there's more than one um, chat, there's more than one change. And the commercial tests tend to test for the most common, but they don't test for all the changes, whereas the research um, testing, such that we do, looks for any of the different um, changes that we see in the RFC1 gene. And as a follow-up to that, we have a few attendees who uh, are identifying that they're genetic counselors and they have specific questions about cannabis mutations. Well, would they be able to reach out to you for more information? Would you be the best source uh, to discuss that? Yeah, look, ha happy for people to reach out to me. I'm happy to um, refer people on if, um, the, if need be for specific questions. But the other thing is, um, when Andrea Cortese does his upcoming session, mm -hmm. um, their questions may be answered in his talk. Oh, that's good. So maybe worth waiting until that. But yes, I'm happy to be contacted, of course. Mm -hmm. And then we have another uh, lay audience member question. Why does there seem to be so much uh, variety in Canvas symptoms? Why is it so heterogeneous? Do we know anything about that? Yeah, I, I'm, I mean, I'm not sure what's meant by um, the variety. Um, so, you know, as I outlined, you have your sort of three cardinal features plus the chronic cough. Um, each of those sort of cardinal um, features can lead to a range of symptoms. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, I've sort of gone through how, how we understand that, um, but I'm not sure what you else know, that person's getting at you know rereading it i might have uh they may be referring to why so many different mutations in rfc1 cause different uh presentations of ataxia is there anything yes. known about that yeah so the answer is not yet um variations in gene changes or what we used to call mutations can cause different phenotypes or mm. presentations, symptoms, if you like. Um, but uh, the truth is that this is being actively investigated and we don't yet really understand it. 
but more research is coming. So that's good to know. Totally. <laughs> and then we have another question. Uh, what causes the dysautonomia in canvas? Is it the spinal ganglionopathy, sensory neuropathy, or something else? Yeah, so we think it's an autonomic ganglionopathy. We think that probably um, the ganglia involved in the automatic or autonomic nervous system um, are affected in the way that we know that other ganglia are affected. That's good to know. And then just scrolling through the questions here, mm -hmm. uh, there we have an attendee who's asking, uh, do we know if stem cell transplants will help improve canvas symptoms? Yeah, at this stage, no, we don't. And, and this goes for all ataxias. Unfortunately, um, there are some unscrupulous um, institutes that um, spruik costly stem cell transplants for treating ataxia, but there's absolutely no evidence that it helps. Um, and in fact, there is always a risk associated. Mm -hmm. So at this stage, the answer is definitely no. And then we have another question. You mentioned in your presentation that you had uh, a brain donated from someone who had Canvas that mm -hmm. helped progress research. Uh, can you speak a little bit about how that process works? How can you donate uh, your brain to attack your mm. research? So, I know we can so speak about our brain donation program, but could you speak about your own experience? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, we've had quite a few people donate their brains, spines, um, inner ear balance mechanisms. And, and, and this is really how we've managed to learn so much about Canvas. And if you think back to those early three slides where I showed um, what happens under the microscope, that, that's how we learned the details. Um, so um, I think that the short answer to um, donations is that it depends where you are um, because it's um, very much a sort of um, local process as to whether um, there is somewhere that you can donate your brain to um, and how you sign up for that, if you like. Um, so I think that that question maybe is best answered by the NAF or um, if you're outside of the US, then to speak to your own um, neurologist. Mm -hmm. um, locally, we had a, a brain bank program um, and also I collaborated with a neuropathologist. So this is a person who looks at um, during life and also after life changes in the brain and other parts of the nervous system. Um, and that's how we got those slides and learnt about all the changes. That's good to know. And then for folks who are based in the US or Canada, the National Ataxia Foundation does have a brain donation program. Information is available on our website in terms of how to sign up for that, if that is something that you are uh, interested in doing. And then we've had a number of people ask questions around the hereditary aspects of Canvas. Uh, mm -hmm. What do we know about the transmission of this disease yes. between generations? Yeah. Um, so, again, I, I imagine Andrea will talk more about this, but the condition is what we call recessive. Um, so that means effectively you need two copies um, of the altered gene, um, which uh, means that if, you, if each of your parents has at least one copy, then you have a 1 in 4 or 25% chance of that being passed down. Well, thank you for clarifying that. And then going back to symptoms related to Canvas. Yes. Uh, someone is asking uh, uh, her husband who has Canvas is often cold. Is that a known symptom? Yeah. So, look, it depends what's meant by cold. Um, mm. But what some people experience is a sensation of cold, um, often related sort of to their skin, so not deep, but they can feel it more deeply. And that can be um, one of the manifestations of the um, sensory changes that I described, whereby um, a normal stimulus can evoke an abnormal sensation. So you remember I talked about something inert, like um, a person's blanket brushing across their um, feet in bed and that that can cause pain or discomfort. Um, similarly, 
um, the messages can get a bit, if you like, mixed up and some people can um, experience um, amplified or incorrect um, feelings of temperature such as cold. Fantastic. Thanks for clarifying that. And our next question, uh, someone uh, was wondering what information is available about the progression timeline of Canvas when you start to get symptoms? How yes. quickly do you develop more symptoms? Yeah. So, look, I mean, not in any way to appear callous, but compared to many other ataxias, Canvas tends to be slowly progressive. Um, and in fact, um, many people with Canvas die with Canvas, not because of Canvas, if that makes sense. Um, it does depend on the individual. It does seem, although we don't know for sure, to depend on how early it starts, but it, it tends to generally affect people when they're a bit older, sort of starting 40 to 60. It can start later, it can start earlier. Um, but again, just as a generalization. And then we've had a few clarification questions come in about the inheritance patterns of Canvas. Could you re-explain that, please? Yeah. So, look, essentially um, what's important um, is that for, for the gene to be passed on, both parents need to have a, a copy of it, um, which is going to be unlikely. Mm -hmm. um, and then if that's the case... Every time those parents have a child, there's a 25% or a quarter chance um, that they will get canvas. Okay, so for the 25% chance uh, to pass it on to kids, both parents need to have canvas. Well, both parents need to have a, at least one copy uh, of the gene. They don't have to have canvas. They can have just one copy, not two. Mm -hmm. So you can carry it and be unaffected. Thank you for re-explaining that. And then just going through the questions again, we'll run a little bit over time just because we started a little bit late. Um, bah, 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 bah. Is it possible for someone who has a mutation in RFC1 to get some of the symptoms of Canvas, but not all of them? In yeah. that case, uh, how would that work? Yeah, so it is. And this is something we're learning about. So people can have different phenotypes, not necessarily canvas. So um, I've seen patients who have, for example, the sensory change and the inner ear balance change, but not the cerebellar change. Um, there have been patients who have just had the cerebellar change. So you don't have to get um, all three. Um, but we don't yet understand the mechanism and that gets back to one of the future directions, which is to try and understand how having the RFC1 gene um, leads to the condition. Wonderful. And then we've had uh, a number of questions around different medications to treat uh, symptoms yes. of canvas. Could you speak to that a little bit, the medications that you're familiar with that some of your patients uh, may be taking yeah. to manage their symptoms? Sure. So um, I talked about the um, the sensory issues um, and the medicines there for neuropathic pain specifically, but can also help those who have um, uncomfortable sensations. Um, and the medications um, I listed as examples were pregabalin, gabapentin, and duloxetine. Um, for the orthostatic hypotension, so that's when you stand up and the blood pressure falls down, um, medications for that include what's called fludrocortisone and another one is mitodrine. Um, there um, have not been any medications yet found in trials um, to help with the ataxia per se. Um, as I say, the only thing that has an evidence base um, is the neurological physical therapy. Um, there are a range of medicines um, that can be used to treat some of the abnormal eye movements, particularly mm -hmm. what we call um, nystagmus, some of the different types of nystagmus. Um, and 
we sometimes trial these medicines where the nystagmus interferes with people's vision. So they may, for example, find that when they're looking at a static object, it's jumping around, let's say up and down. And that might be generated because their eyes are jumping up and down. And so we have the option of um, trialling a medicine to try and, if you like, counter that up and down movement. Fantastic. And then next question, uh, there's a few people asking, uh, how does symptom severity relate to stress? Is there anything known about if people are under more stress, their symptoms get worse with Canvas? Yeah. So, look, I mean, with a lot of um, ataxia, stress can um, bring out certain symptoms, for example, um, tremors um, or imbalance. Um, it's unclear exactly how that happens. So sometimes it seems to be a more direct effect. Sometimes it's indirect in that we know that when people are fatigued, mm -hmm. the symptoms of their ataxia tend to worsen. So they may notice, for example, that their speech is less clear um, or their um, ability to walk is affected. Um, and of course, stress can have an impact on sleep. Sleep is important for fatigue. And so you see that there's also indirect causes. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, bu -bu -bum. just going through, is there any connection between canvas and restless leg syndrome? Yeah, look, that's a really interesting question. Um, and I think that we don't yet know. Um, part of the problem is that restless leg syndrome um, in the general population is not uncommon and increasingly recognised. Uh, so I don't think we yet have enough information to know whether we're seeing just an overlap or we're seeing an increase in restless legs due to um, canvas. Oh, okay. um, regardless, um, it may be important to mention, there are good treatments for restless leg syndrome. Um, that's medications. But um, importantly, the first thing to do is to have your um, iron levels checked because low iron is a reversible cause of restless leg syndrome. So before any medications are considered, we need to make sure it's not just a case of low iron, which we can fix by topping up iron levels. Fantastic. And then our final question of today, uh, if someone has listened to this presentation and this is cemented for them that this matches what their symptoms are and they're going to the neurologist, what advice do you have for them as they're trying to find a diagnosis and they think they may have yeah. canvas? Sure. So, look, I mean, I, I, I think the neurologist is the right kind of doctor to go to. Um, ideally, um, a neurologist who has an interest in ataxia because some neurologists, in fact, a lot will not see that many people with um, ataxia. Um, I know that the NAF keeps a list um, of doctors um, who um, specialize in ataxias um, and from memory in the US that's by state and then also um, there's an overseas register. Mm -hmm. um, if that's not helpful um, and you see a neurologist then I think it's very reasonable to ask whether that neurologist um, knows of a, new, a local neurologist who has an interest in ataxias, um, family physician or general practitioner, depending on where you live, um, may also um, be able to find out for you um, if there's a neurologist who has a specific interest in ataxia. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Smilovich, for spending this time with us and sharing your expertise. We really appreciate you chatting with us today. Um, thanks for the invite and thank you everyone for um, putting up with me talking. <laughs> yes, thank you <laughs> all of the attendees for being here with us and uh, staying with us during our technical problems. We really appreciate your attention. I hope that you found something valuable today and wherever you are in the world, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Have a wonderful day.